years ago when there was a smattering of people in here. So we've been honoured to have lots of people here that have followed our journey and nice to see you, Barry, up the back. And hi to everyone that might be watching the live stream as well. So my name's Naomi Tosik and I run the office space, which is a shared workspace upstairs. And we're really interested and intrigued about the world of work and all of the um, issues and kind of cultural nuances that influence that. So. When we were thinking about this topic um, and looking at the world around us, we really wanted to honour what's happening in the art space and I guess in no way influenced by the funding issues and things like that as well. So um, I'm going to jump into that topic, but I first would like to give a welcome to country and acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land, and pay my respects and our respects to leaders past, present and emerging. And also normally I have Jane Joyce here, who is the CEO of the Sydney Community Foundation, and that is the, um, uh, the group that we support with all of our ticket sales. There's a wonderful program, which is a women's business incubator um, run by Pat Hall. And um, we will still be continuing to support them through this period. But I do have a message from Jane. I think it's here. So if you can imagine me reading, speaking in Jane's wonderfully dignified voice and perfect hair. Um, firstly, a huge thank you to the office space for their long-term support to the Sydney Community Foundation, to vulnerable women in Liverpool through donating regularly to the programs to start up micro business. Today, we can't help but think of the fear in the community and especially our colleagues, friends and family in Melbourne and many in Sydney are fortunately still living comfortable lives. Across the globe, that pandemic is devastating community life. Our focus is supporting local programs in our neighbourhood supporting vulnerable Sydney siders. We're funding food banks, women's shelters, supported education for kids who have lost their way, programs to overcome the isolation of our elderly and especially those who arrived as refugees. In April, we launched Be Kind Sydney COVID-19 Appeal to raise a million dollars for many of the programs that are a lifeline to people having tough times. We're building a community of Sydney siders who support each other when times are tough, people who chip in to help those in need. Will you join? It's not a rhetorical question. Will you join, guys? <laughs> Many hardworking Sydney siders are now without work. The most vulnerable group in our city are women. So since March, we've kept close touch with many remarkable women in our local suburbs. They're running food banks and shelters and services meeting the needs of women and families. So I really encourage you to go on to Be Kind Sydney, so www.bekindsydney.org.au. Um, it was supposed to be something that was launched in Town Hall, I think in March actually, um, and obviously that hasn't happened, but there's been incredible support that's been flowing in for the program. So I encourage you to have a look at the website, Be Kind Sydney, and if there's a small way that you can contribute, perhaps in lieu of the ticket tonight, that would be wonderful. So, Against this grim backdrop of COVID, um, it's really about us looking at the arts and we wanted to see what happens when human creativity meets these intractable life issues. So it's the power of art in all its iterations, to emote, to evoke, to express, and also to educate, to pull on the heartstrings. So we've assembled three extraordinary people who in their daily work grapple with the complex and enduring relationship between art and the human heart. So I wanted to get to the heart of the issue, quite literally, with Professor Ravi Bindi. And he has come straight from Operating Theatre. It was a successful day, which is great news. And apparently the whole Operating Theatre have helped you workshop your responses, which is really fantastic. But um, Ravi is a highly regarded heart surgeon. He's actually the head of cardiology at Royal North Shore. He's an esteemed academic, lots of initials after his name a hundred um, peer review published um, journal entries and also an avid art collector and enthusiast. So I really um, encourage you to welcome Ravi to the stage, please. <laughs> I'll get you just, I think we're <laughs> socially distanced. Socially distanced. Thank Ravi, thank you for being here. I'm glad you made it <laughs> and that all was good today. Let's start with the heart. So historically, culturally, 
religiously, it's been something that's really defined the essence of mankind. So I know you studied psychology kind of as part of your degree. So can you tell us what is this sort of essence of humanity that we hinge on the heart? Look, I've, I've got some notes here, so I'll reference my notes because it's been a rush to get in. <laughs> um, but look, beyond its essential role as a, as a vital organ in the body, as a pump, I think all of you know that um, the heart represents multiple metaph metaphysical connotations beyond its functionality, extending to emotions, passion, love, the soul. And I think this is, uh, in, my, in my view as a cardiologist, the heart is the most symbolic organ in the body. And I think most of you will probably agree um, that symbolically, uh, if not physiologically, it is the most important organ. Uh, it's been broadly referenced uh, in history. Um, Plato theorised uh, that uh, reasoning originated uh, in the mind, but passion arose from the heart. Uh, and throughout history, this is punctuated. I mean, Northern American indig indigenous um, populations um, recognised that uh, the, 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 the heart was the home of the soul. Uh, and even in religious uh, art, um, uh, the, the heart features prominently. Uh, all of us are familiar with uh, pictures of Christ, um, where the heart is, is seen as the love of Christ. And in the, in the images that you see from Christian um, uh, art, uh, you often see light radiating out of the centre of uh, the chest uh, in Jesus, reflecting his love. Um, and similarly, or in contrast, you see the wounded heart or the scarred heart uh, of uh, Jesus uh, reflecting the sacrifices uh, he made before uh, his, uh, his death. And so the heart, in, in a religious sense, I think, uh, has significant connotations. Interestingly, one of the things I, I was reflecting on was um, during the Crusades, uh, warriors that had uh, died during uh, the Crusades, um, the heart was the organ often sent back to the families. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, and that reflected um, the perception at the time that the heart was the container of the essence of mankind, which, which I think I find particularly intriguing um, from, from, from that perspective. The, the, the more contemporary association of the heart with love, I think, is more contemporary con concept. I think uh, it's been reinforced uh, in movies and songs uh, and other more contemporary art forms. Um, even when you pick up your smartphone and you send someone a text, the heart with emojis is, is <laughs> still, is still uh, fairly um, well seen. I think one of the things I, I was thinking about uh, since we had our walk in the zoo um, was, uh, was in, it was in terms of movies, uh, I think disease is also portrayed, uh, diseased heart is portrayed quite well. And one of my favourite movies is The Godfather. And there is a scene, for those of you who have seen The Godfather, when The Godfather dies, he's playing with his grandchild in the garden and then he suffers a massive heart attack and dies. And I think that, in my mind, um, uh, reflects the diseased heart and the public perception of perishing uh, uh, with, with, you know, from the heart. So I think the heart, beyond its functional role, has multiple uh, connotations beyond you know, passion, the soul, love. Yeah, it's powerful. And so let's move from metaphysical to the physical. And I think for us, our high school biology has taught us about this four-chambered muscular pump, but what else might we not know about the heart? Look, just in a, in a very broad sense, I, I was, you know, the heart is about the same size as with one or two fists. If you were to hold that over your body, if you're a child or an adult, one to two fists. It's not really shaped like the classical Valentine heart that you, you see, even though that's the common portrayal in emojis. or in, uh, It's actually an inverted truncated cone, so a cone, like an ice cream cone that's inverted. And that's what it looks like. It pumps 115,000 times a day. Wow. Uh, and the energy it generates is enough to drive a truck, uh, wow. you, know, f um, you know, 20 miles in a day. So it, 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 it's just a very muscular organ uh, that uh, has um, profound energy in, its, in, its, in a true sense, beyond its, its metaphysical um, sense. The, the, the fairy fly, which is a wasp-like creature, has the smallest heart, and the, the blue whale, not unsurprisingly, has the largest uh, heart. And you can actually die of a broken heart. Uh, there is a syndrome called Takasubo syndrome. Takasubo is an octopus nest in uh, Japanese. Um, and when um, vulnerable or susceptible patients are confronted with profound emotions, they can actually get a heart attack-like syndrome that can make them very, very sick. 
um, and, th and, 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 and this can often lead to people dying. Wow. And so you can die of a broken heart. And those are the th things I thought that were fascinating yeah. beyond just the, the, you know, the functionality of the heart. And have they done studies to understand what's at play there, the link between, I guess, the amygdala and all of your emotions in your brain to the heart? Look, it's, it's still a vexed issue, this, this uh, Takasubo syndrome, and, and I'll maybe talk about it a bit later, but I, I um, serve on, on, the, on a heart attack roster at North Shore, so if any of you were to have a heart attack... Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday is my day on call, <laughs> and you're in the North Shore uh, uh, catchment area, then I'll come in to unblock an artery. Heart attack is caused by a blocked artery. Sometimes you have people that attend funerals or have a significant event. So I had a lady who was stuck in a lift in Mossman uh, in her house, and she had to drink her urine overnight because she thought she was going to die because the alarm wasn't working. And so she had a profound experience of panic and distress, and she suffered this tax. But she survived, but she mm. had this profound emotional surge and the argument is that your body goes into uh, overdrive and produce, produces chemicals like adrenaline and catecholamines that then cause a heart attack like state and people get very sick yeah, wow. um, uh, and so that's the, the, the mechanism by which that, that sort of syndrome arises. So for me as a physio undergrad I got to actually witness open heart surgery it was incredibly profound I can't believe that you are doing that pretty much every day you're operating and um, I'm just really curious, does that ever, you know, that wonder of this, I know that you're trained highly skilled to actually do procedures, but do you take that moment to sort of see what's in front of you? What's the reaction each time you need to deal with a heart? Look, just, just to start, I think it's an incredible uh, privilege uh, to be a doctor, to treat um, patients. I think we constantly remind ourselves that it is a privilege to treat people who are often, you know, the heart is so important. I mean, you don't need to know much about the heart to recognise its centrality in survival and to be able to treat people that are at the most vulnerable parts of their uh, journey, these are unexpected events, is an incredible privilege and I think uh, for me personally the heart pro uh, provides an ongoing satisfaction and fascination. For example, we mentioned COVID-19, uh, we were leading the Australian cardiovascular registry because it was identified that those patients with cardiac disease were more likely to perish from uh, COVID-19, something we didn't understand. The COVID you know, viruses are fairly simple um, uh, organisms. They need cellular machinery to thrive. And so the biological explanation is it binds to a receptor like the Star Wars docking station to the Death Star. The, this virus comes and attaches to a receptor that's overexpressed in patients uh, with heart disease. And so we're exploring that link. There's always that ongoing fascination with learning uh, something new that we've, you know, when our elective activity, well, not that heart disease is elective, but when our activity had stopped, we've now tried to understand what is driving COVID-19. But I think beyond the heart being a complex muscular structure with electricity and valves, I think it's probably uh, one of the most well-studied organs and organ systems in the body. And so in terms of the treatment I deliver is very well researched and evidence-based. And so we can really categorically determine whether this treatment works and doesn't work. And the other fascination is that there's constant rapid evolution. And I think um, if there's one thing that you guys take away uh, is that the innovation, um, we, the, the, the mind power and the brain power required to evolve is incredible. Today I did um, three or four uh, valve replacements with people awake uh, with a small tube put in their leg with them talking to me and 10 years ago they would have had to have their chest open, they would have had to uh, been put on heart bypass and, um, and so the rapidity with which we can oh. evolve things and be part of that journey of driving things forward. So when you say publications, it's not the publications that matter, it's the contribution to our understanding uh, and driving things forward so that things that were untreatable uh, are now treatable, not to extend life, but improve quality of life. So I, I think that's important. But what strikes me, I think, beyond that is the heart, both physically and metaphysically, is, 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 is vulnerable. It's, it's a vulnerable organ, uh, both biologically and metaphysically. And I think small insults to the heart can have profound effects, yeah, as, as you know. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the heart is very resilient, you know. Um, people recover from things that um, you never think they'd recover from. So if you were to come in with a heart attack and you'd, 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 have, been come, you'd have come tonight and, and uh, it could affect any of us in this room. 
and um, elite athletes, people with no risk factors. You don't have to be overweight. You don't have to have diabetes or high blood pressure. You can be sitting down and the next day you could be wheeled in with a heart attack. And so I think that, and you're sick and you're almost going to die. And then the opportunity to, to, to treat people, I think, is always, um, always uh, rewarding from my perspective. It's challenging because you don't win all the time. And to sit down with a, um, a young wife or husband with kids to say, look, things who you don't have a relationship with, a doctor-patient relationship because you've never met them, they've just come off the street with a sudden event, is fairly confronting. But I think that's part of the beauty with, with this field is that the heart is so important um, and, and I think having that journey is, is particularly uh, been rewarding. So there's, there's every day you turn up, there's always some excitement, interest and, and um, service, I suppose. Amazing. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Why did you choose the heart out of all the possible things that you could have settled on? Look, I mean, I think in a simplistic sense, I think treating the heart, I think for me, I think oh, there's different fields in medicine, I think for those of you, aren't and the heart offers a unique opportunity to use your stethoscope, to listen to the heart, to examine someone, uh, to talk to someone. History, they, as they say, taking a history from someone gives you a diagnosis in 70% of people. And, and there's nothing like cardiology where you can talk to someone and almost instantly work things out. Then you can measure the electrical activity of the heart, you can look at the heart with ultrasound, you can put tubes into the heart and measure pressures. So there's that complete um, concept of complete treatment. And then you can operate, you can fix things, there's plumbing, there's electricity. Um, <laughs> but, but importantly, I guess perhaps more importantly from my perspective, uh, not only can you have the, off the opportunity to improve survival, but you can improve the quality of life sure. of patients. I think that's the most important thing that patients, particularly older patients, they don't care about whether they're going to live two, three years longer. They want quality of life. And for us in a society that's ageing, a society with older people, the opportunity to offer them treatment allows them to remain independent, not to be sent to a high level uh, nursing facility. I think is, is, is really rewarding because we really make an impact at a society level. I'm curious about that. What proportion are elderly and young and also what's elective versus more emergency? So I think, you know, I'd say in my practice, you know, you know 30 to 40 percent would be elective mm -hmm. and the majority would be right. urgent or, uh, or emergent. High stress then? Um, it, well, um, it's just the nature of heart disease. Is yeah. you, you don't plan to have heart disease. You, you can plan uh, to reduce the chance of having heart disease. You're often born with heart disease. Um, we are seeing uh, a, a, a shift towards older patients, so there is things that happen. I mean, your heart is a pump that's got valves in it. It opens and closes, and if it opens and closes often enough, it degenerates like anything, like an old pump or an old pipe. Um, and so older patients are more susceptible yeah. or vulnerable. Um, I wanted to be a paediatric cardiologist when I was young, but, yeah. I, I, but, but dealing with uh, kids, I yeah. think, and seeing kids that are vulnerable and susceptible, I don't think Especially I have the... Especially with your own family Yeah, I well. don't think I have the emotional yeah. uh, repertoire, resilience to be able to, to provide that. And I think, you know, so within my field, there are some people that are special that can provide that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've talked about the physical, so let's have a look at the um, creative side of you because you are more than just a heart surgeon. So tell us through your um, right brain. Is it right or left? I've got a blank. Which is the creative side? Well, That's well, your I, right... I, well, I, I, I can say, and I can make an honest confession, Naomi, um, even though you asked me to probe deeply, um, <laughs> you know, whilst I have a deep appreciation of creative art, uh, I, I, I enjoy art, I appreciate good art, uh, both written, or visual, um, in, in any form. Uh, I don't think I have any uh, meaningful talent <laughs> in the classical artistic sense, and, and, and therefore I, I, it makes me look at artists with more wonder because it's an incredible talent uh, that they have. Um, I guess I do wear a hat as a clinical uh, uh, researcher um, and in my mind I can think of clinical problems or patient focused issues where I can have um, uh, a challenge and we have a canvas to try and solve um, the problem and so we can be creative in the way we address uh, clinical medical issues, we create patterns and pathways and discuss things and ultimately the canvas becomes a picture yeah. that addresses things. Yeah. But I guess that in a sense does involve the other side of the mind. It's not a truly creative, um, uh, you know, 
Apparently Ravi's um, drawings for patients are appalling, like when he draws the heart. So, <laughs> so, 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 so in, in some form I interacted with, a, with an art teacher who told me that I would have been a miserable failure, <laughs> that even her year four girls would have um, drawn better. But, but Naomi, one of the other things is that I, you know, for instance, e every year for the last 20 years, there's been a heart meeting in, in France, in Paris, um, that I've attended. Uh, and I've always been, I've always gone to the Pompidou Centre to see the Kandinsky collection. Um, and and this, this meeting occurs in May every year, and it's only for two or three days, because that's the only time you can be there for. Uh, but I still go to the Pompidou Centre every year to look at the Kandinsky collection. There's a limited number, and this is abstract art. And I think I, I recall um, these painting or these, these, these art forms talking differently to me each time mm. at different phases of my life, trying to work out what the artist is trying to communicate, but also my response. And of all the things, you know, and as you know, Paris is, a, is full of ri um, richness. I've, I, you know, art does speak to people, and you know, Kandinsky with the abstract, abstract yeah. uh, form really um, has, has been something that I've been drawn to. Whether it's been habitual now, I, I can't be sure, but I do think it's certainly something that I find evokes a sense of creativity and, and exploration. I think the exploration is a good point, just the idea of the unknown. I think when your work is so literal and there's a right and a wrong, I think there's some freedom in that perhaps. Um, also, a lot of your clients and your patients are very well-known artists and composers and musicians. So um, there's sort of almost the, the crux of this whole conversation is Ravi and I will often talk about what's that link between art and the heart and is it un, unhealthy to kind of have this, you know, this need to express. Often you see like with Van Gogh and um, kind of these famous artists where they're plagued by these other health things but they can create incredible art because of that intensity. So um, obviously we don't want to cast that bow that you know artists are crazy or anything like that but I think it's interesting like the yeah what's your thoughts around health human health and then the expression of art look I mean it's easy to generalize but I think uh, much of the greatest art artistic comp compositions either music or visual art or any form of art I think has come from uh, experiences that um, deep experiences you know deep dark sorrowful um, dangerous um, experiences to ecstatic, happy, joyous experiences. Um, uh, you know, these emotions are on the borders, the border zones of human emotional fragility, I, I guess. Um, and it cuts both ways, I suppose. I, th I think um, you need to be driven. I think the passion and the uh, experience, I think, drives that creativity. And if you don't touch the border zones or the extremes, then you, I, I, I wonder whether you would ever be able to be as inspirational. I mean, you look at Robin Williams you know, in his uh, art form of, of movies. I mean, he was an incredibly talented person and he had his own challenges. Um, so I think, you know, in my mind, I think it is, it is a, um, a challenging uh, experience. I do think art offers the individual um, an opportunity to express themselves. I think uh, some people can express themselves easily conversationally, some people can't. And so art is an opportunity to express yourself or to take salvage or solace in your, in your work. And I think that physiologically manifests as, you know, with, with benefits. Um, I mean, artists can, however, as you know, be overtaken or subsumed by the art form. Um, you know, it can become, the subject of the art can become so all consuming that it can be destructive. I think you just need to look at Heath Ledger and his role as the Joker, which he acknowledged really uh, destroyed him, I guess. I mean, he became so obsessed and um, overtaken by his role as the Joker. And I think we, we all are familiar with Heath Ledger's story that, yeah. that I think that, uh, you know, so whilst it's inspirational from the depths of the extremes of health and passion, I think that, that there are the other all-consuming effects. And I do feel that's what pulls us, is it's compelling almost that the depth of human experience and the heights of it as well. It's No one wants to see artwork necessarily from someone that's perfectly happy and untouched yes. by life. So I think the reverse is also true. true. The World Health Organization published a big study in November last year and they were saying that um, 
a, they did a whole peer-reviewed study and looked at art and all forms of art and they found that it actually was beneficial for health. So do you find that your patients benefit from an interest in art, music, drawing, writing as well? Look, absolutely. I think, I think people, I think there's well research, there's good research to support that. I mean, I think it's quite easy to see that those that engage in um, creative art forms uh, have less stress, less mood disturbances, um, their physiological parameters are more stable and in turn um, you know, has better if potential effects on long-term health. Uh, but it cuts both ways, though, Naomi, because I think, um, I think a lot of artists, particularly those that are very talented and um, gifted, uh, often ha grapple with other health issues or challenges um, and, and, and that can also be potentially destructive. So whilst, yes, there is a clear benefit of art um, uh, or creative, creative art and, and health, um, often those at the extremes that produce um, you know, amazing stuff are often challenged by other yeah. conundrums. I'm sure we'll hear about that tonight yeah. as well. I think that's, um, for me, I, I recognise as someone that's not artistic, but artists bleed on a canvas. They yeah. really show their emotion and their humanity. So I think that's something to honour. My last question, and it's something that I'll ask each of the panel, um, and obviously as someone that deals with the human heart every day, what is your personal position on the relationship between art and the heart? Look, I, you know, I mean, you know, I think, um, I think creativity comes from the heart. I mean, I think I see in my patients, um, what I see in my patients perhaps relates to what an artist sees in his or her subjects. Um, I think um, passion and emotion is what drives creativity and good art, in, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, I think physiologically there's a good basis for that because when you are emotional and passionate, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up and you feel that in your heart. Yeah. And so whilst that, the mind might be thinking it, you feel it here because your, your, chest, you know, your chest feels heavy and you feel the drive. And I think that that metaphysical association with the heart, um, I think, is associated with passion, which in my mind drives good art. Quickens the heart. Amazing. Ravi, thank you so much. Yeah. Please thank Ravi. <laughs> Done. <laughs> And thank you to your theatre team as yeah, they well. Were, they, were, they were inspired by the <laughs> So it's a perfect segue then on to Matt DeBeowen. So Matt is Health Education Team Manager at the Uniting Medically Supervised Injecting Centre at in King's Cross, which is the first one of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. We hear about that. He's a proud curator of art from the heart of the cross and um, I just stumbled across the incredible program that these guys are doing in King's Cross and it invites people that visit the clinic to actually participate in art. So very much it's not positioned as art therapy, it's really around um, humanising the experience and connecting with the individual. So please welcome Matt to the stage. Did you have help with your answers? Uh, not, not directly, <laughs> but over the years definitely. Well, yeah. you joined in 2014 and you were pretty much straight out of uni when you went yeah. straight to King's Cross. What was that like? Yeah. Um, so I, I, went, um, I went back to uni to do social work because I um, actually previously in a previous life I wanted to be a filmmaker and I um, was making a documentary about someone who was homeless and injecting heroin and there was a point where my artist hat switched to, I just want to help this person. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I recall visiting him in the McDonald's near Town Hall without a camera, without an agenda, just to see how he was. Mm -hmm. And um, he, actually it would, it would be eight years, like to the week, actually he died um, of, mm -hmm. of um, uh, liver cancer, uh, to do with hep, hep C, hepatitis C, and I thought that's that's not the end of this. I need to go and do something. So I was really conscious to wanting to work in the space where homelessness and trauma meets addiction. And the the first time I went to visit the injecting center uh, uh, on a tour as a student, I went. This is I belong here. Um, and so I just worked there ever since, basically. Tell us about it, for us who yeah. might not have been there. I just want to say, actually, I, 
I'm noticing my heart racing. So it's, inter ah, it's interesting. Uh, it's take interesting. Your pulse. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Like, because we uh, we have an um, the heart tells us an emotion sometimes. So if you're feeling nervous or whatever, your heart yeah. will tell you. So that's what's going on for me right now. Um, <laughs> uh, so the the service is called the medically supervised injecting center, and we're the first one uh, in Australia. We opened in 2001. And we're so thankful that there's now one in, uh, in Melbourne that opened a couple of years ago and they want to open a, another one in a different part of Melbourne and that was announced recently and that's a, a huge win for our cause. And essentially what we're about really in a nutshell is harm reduction and um, understanding that people will inject drugs and there's lots of issues around that but they shouldn't die because of that and it's actually where we're talking about overdose on things like heroin it's really really simple to not let that person die yeah. uh, it, uh, yesterday i was <laughs> involved in saving someone's life it, and all it took was injecting them with this essentially a remedy medication called naloxone that reverses the effects of the heroin and that person I saw him today, he's, he's fine. Um, so what we're about is providing a non-judgmental space for someone to come and do what they were going to do anyway. Yeah. And there's lots of politics behind that, there's lots of sort of um, uh, social story behind it and to how and, and why we exist, um, but essentially that's it. If, if you can watch someone inject and you can see them at the point at which they're overdosing, they're not gonna die. Um, and, and that's what we're about. So it, it's harm reduction basically. And, and we, we approach uh, everything we do and the service we provide from uh, a human rights perspective as well and, and uh, in line with um, you know, some really core values of um, you know, uh, Advocate, advocating for social justice uh, around drug law reform and, and um, uh, drug policy and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, we, you know, it, it's actually, it's, it's so simple. As I describe it now, it's just if you're just there when someone's using drugs and then you s help them if they need it. And it speaks and very much to our mortality and again the heart as an mm. instrument and an organ and yeah it's very much you're on the cusp of that. Tell us about the yeah. amazing people you work with, what are the clinicians in the centre? Yeah, well, our, so our team is, um, so I, I am the manager of one half of the team, they're called the health education officers, so that's a really eclectic bunch of people uh, from different sort of um, you know, social science type backgrounds. And then we have a nursing unit as well. And they, they're the other half of the team. And, and it's, it's, um, it's really great. Like it, it, we get to work together really closely and, and um, pr basically, unless it's like an emergency or some medical need, we really simply just provide like a welcoming, hospitable mm -hmm. environment. It's Some a, yeah, and I catch myself sometimes just being in the injecting room and watching people and going, this is really unique, actually. And sometimes it's really weird, um, but it's so normal because we make it normal. We make it human and welcoming and, and there's a literally like a hospitality element to it, like, a, like you might do at a pub, like, yeah. you know, um, there's training and, and, you know, a lot more to it, but really we're, we're there to, foster a human connection and relationship so that people trust us for to come and uh, do this quite vulnerable intimate thing in, yeah. in front of us and, and trust us that we will intervene if they need help. That's a really powerful Matt. Yeah. Let's talk about the art because it's a way for people in that space to connect with themselves but also yeah. with the team. So yeah. this started 10 years ago. Tell us about who started it and then how what you've done with it. Yeah so we we, um, I, I uh, wasn't involved in starting it. Um, there's a few key people, um, uh, Natasha, Sarah and James, um, who I think just basically went, let's do some art. Really, I think it was that simple. And it was sort of like giving people 
some, probably some like colored pens and notepads really and said, here you go, show us what, you know, um, show us, um, show us what you can do sort of thing. And, and it, it was, I think the, the philosophy of it is, um, and where I've really taken it and, and, and uh, wanting to uh, champion still is, um, as a service, we're set up so that people don't die, and we're so good at that. Mm -hmm. um, just, it's, it, it's, it's fantastic. But we want to be have a human connection with people, so we understand that not dying is not the same as living, and so we, these types of things are about living, uh, and they're about being a, a person with a voice, and it, it's. Um, about providing access for people who may not have access anywhere else. Um, a lot of the, our, our clients um, are in various stages or oscillating between being precariously housed or sleeping rough. Um, a lot of, I would say the, definitely the majority of our clients that we see, regardless of their actual story, have experienced trauma and, and um, most likely complex trauma in, in childhood. So that's things like, um, uh, you know, physical and, and um, sexual abuse as, as a young, young person. Um, and, sorry, I've lost my, my train of thought, but, um, so we... Just how, those, you, how you help them and... Yeah, sorry. I, um, so for some people, they may not have access to just getting a canvas and some paint and having a go because it literally might be raining and cold outside and they just can't do it and they don't have anywhere else to sleep. Or it's not part of their idea to do that. Yeah, um, or they get robbed every single night and they can't have it. So the core of this, where this really started was like, well, art is a really human thing. Let's let's just open it up and um, provide the access to it. And um, I appreciate yeah. that about the program. It's not contrived. It's sort of not, you know, billed as this thing as a rehabilitation. It's really an expression and yeah. uh, play in a way. And uh, yeah, I think that's really positive. So there's not really any rules except they can't take the artwork out. It has to stay in the space. So what is sort of the yeah. boundaries? What's the medium that they're working in and what's the invitation for them? Yeah, so let's just pretend COVID's not happening because <laughs> it's, it's all quite different. <laughs> right, literally right now, it's, we're starting again next week. Um, so we would have, um, uh, we would turn what we call like uh, our aftercare area. It's like a little just hang out, chill out zone. And we're actually, we use it for monitoring people after they've had their injection too, just in case the there's a delay onset of the overdose or, or you know, some complication. So, and there's, there's a table and we turn a bit of our clinical space literally into just uh, uh, paints, like um, acrylic paints that, and, and lots of little um, palettes and brushes. And actually it's, it's really wonderful. The, the blank canvases get hung on the wall and people can literally just come and take one down and go, oh, I'm gonna work on this one. And then they, their own canvas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then they, as, as it's a work in progress, they hang it there to dry and they say, I'll work on that again next time. And over the course of the four to six weeks, the wall goes from just like blank, sort of ugly canvases to completed works. And, and it, it just fills our space with art. Let's talk about yeah. the content of that work. I encourage you all to have a look online. So it's yeah. Art from the Heart of the Cross and you can see some of the past exhibits exhibitors. Yeah. So tell us about some of the artists and the work that they've done. Yeah, so some... Some favourites. Yeah, the, uh, so this was in, in the, the questions and I had to think about it. So the, obviously there's no favourites. Um, we, <laughs> we can't have favourites. Something but, that speaks to you. <laughs> yeah. um, there's one, one person who over the course of the last few years, um, so their partner died uh, from suicide in 2017, I think, uh, a few years ago. And they, as, as we, we all would or we all might, they 
that was traumatic, very, very traumatic. Mm -hmm. And um, that year, in 2017, that person painted, and it, it was literally a dark uh, canvas, like, like the paints, the colours they chose were dark, and it was a... Um, it was a, a it was it depicted a person sitting outside of our service saying please help me like a, a someone might write on a piece of cardboard uh, you know to encourage people to give them change or whatever and and it, you just you couldn't even really see it because it was so dark and that was that person expressing something to to us and and to to the community as well and o over the course of the years uh, so last year he painted these vibrant, like literally brighter, colorful mm. things. And it's, um, I talked with him about it and he just said, you know, he, he didn't really want to really go there with me, you know, in the emotional part of it, but he just indicated that he doesn't need, he doesn't need to express that anymore in, in the artwork. He can, mm. he can express other things now. And, and um, that, it just it just exemplifies not only the importance of doing it year after year and being there for our clients, but how someone's voice can change over yeah. time and what they need through their artwork can change over time. And we've talked yeah. about the power of art for the individual, but also for you as the clinician. Mm. And um, but what about for us regarding the art? How can it speak to yeah. us to tell a different story? It's not on the paper. I yeah, didn't ask yeah. you that one. No, I think, I think I, I fundamentally think that um, art is just a human thing to do. Mm. And what I want this project, this, I, I just happen to work at this injecting room and we just happen to be doing art. But those are just coincidences. The, the art is a, to create art is a human thing regardless of any other factor. And so what I hope, the, the, the sort of the big picture goal of it is that the community or the, the viewer just appreciates someone else's creativity mm -hmm. and they just happen to be a person who injects drugs and, yeah. and, and a client of our service. And I actually think that, that the it's, it's an opportunity for, um, for our clients to create, but it's an opportunity for everyone, for the viewer to engage with or see something or, or learn about something they may not really ever have, um, not, not through a lack of interest on their part, but just a lack of access for the artists and a lack of uh, platform for um, art created by people that inject. Um, and I think that, what I want to convey to, you know, when we have an exhibition or when it's, when I'm talking about, it, I want to convey that um, it's a, I think an artist gives a gift to their audience, regardless of the, that artist's circumstances. Um, and that's what I hope the, the community um, can, can see and, and, and take from it. And they're learning about a specific person who has a story and, and that's part of the artwork itself sure. but I want I want this bigger concept of what is art for to encompass this pro this this project is, um, which is that um, no matter what our story or our differences or um, beliefs or all, all the programming we have um, we all have some creativity creativity in us yeah. um, it may not be sort of traditionally artistic but um, if we can engage with that we can just connect on that really really deep human what it what it means to be a human level it's a powerful conduit isn't it yeah i think so you're very yeah. passionate about this program and we spoke for a long time about yeah. it and last year you exhibited in a real bona fide art yeah. gallery yeah. so what is your big dream if you put it out there you never know who's <laughs> watching um, what, where do you hope that this will continue to grow and progress to I think um art gallery <laughs> yeah well, well um as 
I think I think there's may, maybe there's two two sides to it. So one one side is for for the benefit of the audience. Bigger is better, and and you know the more people that see it, the better. Um, and so yeah, and you know the the art gallery of New, uh, New South Wales or wh whatever. I, uh, someone even suggested like projecting the art on the opera house during Vivid. Great, like let let yeah, if bigger we, the better. <laughs> yeah, if if we can do it, great. Um, for for the the artists, the clients. Um, they always have to be part of it. They have so. to, they, so it's about access to the materials and the time and the space to create, but they must have access to the, to seeing it, to, 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 to be able to go to sure. the, to an, a space, whatever that yeah. space may be. And it, um, putting it in, in an art gallery last year was by design to say to, our artists, you created art, and um, we we put it in a gallery. So people are attending that with a different mindset. They know they're going to an art gallery, so they they're ready to engage with art. Yeah. Um, and I think that it. I ha I, I did talk with some artists afterwards, and they they expressed just that this is where it belongs. It this is where art belongs in an art gallery or, or indeed if people buy the art then it's you know hung up in their house or their office or whatever but that's that's where it belongs it takes it it helps us um sort of get past the the circumstances of the people that created it although that is always in there mm -hmm. and it helps us move into this is just one human communicating to another through a paint some paint on a canvas or a poem or and it's whatever. not to brush aside it's incredibly complex mm -hmm. you know there's so many topics around this conversation but yeah. I think just that the humanity that comes through between art and artist and viewer is pretty powerful so I'm going to end on the same question to Ravi which was your experience of the relationship between art and the human heart yeah uh, um, I think I think art is a for the for the viewer is a lens through which we can understand something, whether that's our own emotion or someone else's story or how the world operates. Um, and actually, I think it it's about empathy. Actually, mm. it, it's you you look at uh, an art, and if it if it touches you, there's probably an element of your your recognizing in the artwork and the artist, they're saying to you as the viewer, I've been there, or I know what that's like. And actually that's just our ability to then understand that person's story. And you have a sense that the artist understands your story because they've communicated something. That's just the... That's what makes us human. Yeah, and, and that's what empathy is. Beautifully put. Thank yeah. you so much, Matt, please. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. As she takes a big drink, my next guest is Next Generation Development Manager for Art Gallery New South Wales, which could be a potential venue. We never know, Matt. <laughs> so within this high and huge and mighty institution, I like to think of the Atelier, which is the group that Saha looks after, a little bit like a tugboat that's sort of navigating its own way in this, this industry. And if that's the tugboat, then this is the captain here, <laughs> the fearless captain. Um, and yeah, I just think it's really exciting the way that Saha wrestles and thinks about art and um, not just things on walls, but actually about mobilising and um, cultural kind of change. So I won't steal her thunder, I'll let her talk about that. Please welcome Saha Jones to the stage. <laughs> Saha, welcome. So your deep conviction is that art is a powerful enabler of kind of social and human change. What are the big things that you are grappling with at the art gallery? Oh, and just uh, to make a little footnote I haven't read the question so oh, you don't have to you don't have to <laughs> um biggest things I'm grappling with um at the gallery well I see the gallery as an extension of my life um and a version of myself or versions of myself that I have to be there 
and beyond. Like tonight, even tonight, I, I wear that hat proudly, but it's problematic as well because there's so much nuance in our lives um, and the many faces that we have or have to have um, right now, the, those themes of grappling, I think, um, especially after the content that you've provided yeah. tonight is just a yearning um, for art to be truly the connector, the unifier, rather than this thing, this thing that's seen as an add-on or a luxury or an exclusive experience or only for those who understand it or have studied it or only for those who can pay to, for the privilege. Yeah. Um, when that robs us of our... It robs us of, of truth with a capital T because beyond the humanity, which philanthropy is, you know, the, the, love. the love of humanity yeah. and we say this all the time, beyond that there's a whole universe out there of feeling and being and creation. Um, so where to pull all those threads in and to, you know, to refer to what you were saying about the publications or the peer-to-peer peer to, um, peer reviewing and the, the history or the repository of, of um, thought or what we know we know is um, constantly leading us into this direction of cycles but also of infinite possibilities so if that's true then that must be true for our own potential yeah. and art is is um, it's a, sort of a way to materialize or make material the the universal language that we all speak human or not and it's a constant tension, I think, because we, we look at things like philanthropy, health, hum, humanitarian causes, and then there are the arts, and often they are seen to sit on different ends of the spectrum. But kind of your view is that we're integrated individuals, and I think you're very passionate about humanitarian causes and through the gallery with refugees, mm. Indigenous rights, but also there is the ability to express as everyday people. Yeah. I want to look at your art journey, which is... Super interesting. So tell us about your experience growing up and share with us the kind of crucible of your life. Oh gosh, it's um, like really hard to put it all into a tiny moment. But um, I have had a very creative environment growing up and uh, both my parents are artists. Uh, I call them artists because that's the most general term to describe what they do. They're activists, they're writers, they're directors, performers. My dad was a ballet dancer in the 60s actually. I turned uh, 33 two weeks ago and um, my dad wrote me a letter, they write me a letter every year, both my parents. And this year he, his letter sort of started with I was 33 when I returned to Australia when Gough Whitlam was elected <laughs> because there was going to be money to being poured into the arts and mm. um, coming from a company in London and actually he couldn't get a green card. He was meant to join the Jose Lamon company in New York but didn't get a green card and then Gough Whitlam was elected and he was like, okay, coming back to Australia to bring, um, you know, modern, modern ballet, Martha Graham, um, Rombert back to Sydney and ha he found a warehouse space and that's now World Square. Um, wow. So I think from my heart, I mean, ca I'm finally able to really voice these memories um, in a way that honours the fact that I've had, a, I've had a very privileged upbringing because it was so weird and... Um, and cultured as well, like in terms of wealth of experiences and exposure, it was insane. It was probably quite dangerous at times it was as well. Experimental theatre. So experimental. That you're, you didn't go to conventional <laughs> school, so it was more around theatre yeah. and creative people coming and going. So obviously, I was that's... afraid of the stage, and I still am. So I echo that <laughs> like heart feeling, and you know. Um, and any time there's a rise, you know, there's even learning sign language at the moment and that's the sign for I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. So it's like a rise, you know, that comes out of you and 
it contracts and it expands and it's very um, malleable and extensive that can be so rigid as well. But if we have frameworks like your pro incredible program um, where people can, like in a gallery, you're kind of one step removed. It's a platform, it's, it's intended as a platform. Um, but we need to be careful that we don't distance ourselves, funnily enough, just, um, COVID. <laughs> too much, you know, like there's a death in that space as well. There's a death, you can feel death in museums and institutions and, um, but they're incredible spaces to be involved in because they reflect our world. And so they have, you know, the, um, every single, uh, pathway of possibility as well as every single obstacle in the way and there's so many people that, um, who are working behind the scenes or in, in front as well and um, it teaches you a lot about politics and how it does have a personal implication on your own life and the life of your community as well. I don't think you just wake up one day and think oh, I'm going to help the guy who was sexually abused down the street who's got a heroin problem. Um, I think we observe our world and there's, there's willful ignorance. In a movement, it's emoting something. I wanna talk about um, how you, with Atelier, do incredible job changing people from consumers to actual um, contributors, which is really powerful. Mm. But let's stick with um, another incredible experience for you. Um, for two and a half years, you were in Uluru as kind of what age was that and kind of what was your experience it was in was it Matajulu? Mutujulu. Mutujulu. We just call it Muri. Muri. So tell us about that and obviously how that has shaped your sensibilities around art and around human rights. It really I think what it did for me is it brought everything up until that point home and that felt like a real heart experience mm -hmm. and before I'd even really engaged with the history of the rock or you know it's like iconic status in the world I I hadn't sort of gone on that journey of understanding those narratives that are attached to it I've, I arrived pretty ignorant um, and just was confronted with myself immediately mm -hmm. in that space and the sacred energy of that land and it's you know with the with the sort of trajectory of um uh civil rights in this country and race relations and everything like that coming to a sort of a, t a major intersection at the moment globally and here um there's there's something about the rock that heals you and challenges you and it could go either way it could you know, it could sort of potentially destroy you or it could um, give you this, the ability to believe in something far bigger than yourself and the, the sort of um, the energy that resonates in that space going back thousands of years where people would commune there and um, co very connected by the elements and the north, south, east, west marking that that place and in in their understanding of um, of their environment, mm. all through observational learning as well. So, you know, we think of indigenous cultures as not having literacy when actually it's the earliest form of coding, in my opinion. So as I was learning from them, I knew I had to learn language just oh, wow. straight away wow. and learn that they have sign language, which isn't for someone who has access needs. It's actually a practical tool that you use from a distance. You can communicate with people from 100, 200, 300 meters away. And that just blew me away. And the language, like the ancient quality of the language too, was sort of very influential in giving me a really good schooling about um, what I needed to do with my life 
And I think that's the thing I know you're always looking to learn and I think that's the power of art. You've mentioned healing, but then it is communication, it is to emote, to protest as well. So for you, you know, is art all of those things and what's your intention for what Atelier might be investing in and acquiring for so Sydney Modern is part of the project mm. that you're acquiring for. So what are the sorts of artworks that you want to be really spearheading the Atelier movement? Look, I mean, I think with Atelier, um, you know, it began as a next generation program and you, you can kind of see that as a model that is has been popping up and it's the next gen kind of branding in our world is quite prominent, it's everywhere. Um, but for me, it was more about uh, having had a person, my predecessor, Claire oh, Herschel. Who was on our panel last she year. Was. Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, and she, she sort of is someone like, I actually I compare her to, a bit to Jessie Street, if anyone knows Jessie Street, who was also very involved in Indigenous rights. Um, she was the only woman who represented at the UN in Geneva and someone called her a secretary and she's like, no, I'm a lawyer actually. Um, and yeah, so Claire, obviously not a lawyer, but a philanthropist and a powerful uh, feminist without the, the, the kind of um, claustrophobic academic, academic <laughs> discourse that goes with that. Um, and living, living your life with the lot that you were given, having an understanding of what that is, is, you know, and then going through a process of how to activate that. And then you change your whole perception as well on redistribution of, of wealth and wealth not being money, but wealth being resources, which is the planet, yeah. starts with the planet and that what sustains us. Um, and then how we treat each other and how we kind of um, are involved in a promise, a relationship, a marriage, a union with, with each other, with, um, with our environment and who we share our space with. And that's definitely what I've learnt from Indigenous communities the most and tr translating that back into my Western um, education and thinking and our eastern suburb environment yeah. as well which is a challenge and this is the thing though when you speak of philanthropy it's not just about money and kind of this plurocratic society it's really about people coming together with resources to to have yeah. a new voice so tell us about who makes up the atelier I'm a proud atelier <laughs> atelier began um, sort of with friends like a giving circle and then the aim was to um, to gather as many people as possible and form the the hundred next gen group at the art gallery of New South Wales and this was sort of tied in quite um, strategically to the new Sydney modern um, project which we feel very much is like a rebirth of that space as well um, and an expansion of that precinct with so much possibility for how public spaces and institutions, public mm. collections are co-owned and also have to be co-created. So if you don't identify as an artist or you don't identify as an art lover, it, uh, if you don't identify, you could, in other words, you could identify in many ways, but philanthropy is kind of like a, a secret door um, with a big sign on it <laughs> <laughs> um, that allows you to be um, a civic, play a civic role um, in designing the community that you live in. And so I think for me coming to philanthropy at this point in my life, it feels really natural because it's not something that I've like learnt at uni or I'm an expert on, but it's something that I, I feel with my heart and then I act with my brain. Um, I don't have the answers, but I know a lot of people who do. Yeah. So let's use that group. and harness that and harvest that and harvest, think of it as, you know, it's not a charity to set up all different kinds of education models that use art as its interface. But it's a storytelling and it's a, we can collect data from that. I mean, who cares about what we're buying on the internet? If they're co collecting that information, I wanna hear about the stories that are happening with, with people who are dedicated to those spaces as well. And we see it, more, we see it in line with investment and reconciliation and reparation and, um, 
uh, that's something that can be activated at many levels throughout the community and we, we can have a, a very, um, I, can th I think we have a hopeful future if we can see that. Well let's talk about the future then and the idea of um, Atelier. For you it's almost an experiment in sort of this thought leadership and what it can be, sort of design thinking, lots of these big ideas. But for you it's really again it's changing from a consumer to someone to a collective that are able to make some change yeah. and you and I spoke about often museums are historical they're kind of showing the past but it's like what do we want to herald for the future so what is it that what's the power that that art can do to sort of change the way that we're going as a society oh gosh well I mean even to I don't think I answered the last question you asked me what, who who is Atelier who make up Atelier yeah, yeah. and and this is not something new. There's benefaction groups are plenty at the art gallery and many other institutions. Philanthropy sort of founds that historically. Um, in those times too, there were the thought leaders. There were people who were, um, you know, uh, rocking the boat. And there was there were people that would push things through. And so small changes or grand changes did happen, and that happens now as well. So. We feed into the great root system of that legacy yeah. and our sort of, um, we want to be transformative as a group in what we do. So where we, where we deliver our, our collected funds, how we do that, why we do that, how that complements the gallery and the, the, the broad, in the broad sense of um, the gallery because, you, you know, the next gen, um, for me is all of us, it's not an age thing, it's not whether you're an artist or whether you come from um, you know, uh, family wealth or self-made wealth, it's more that these spaces can be nourished by anyone and you decide for yourself if that's within your means. So, you know, um, for and me... I like how you talked about the roots as well, tapping into that. It's not the idea of hacking at the roots and sort of no. attacking the institution, but yeah. just being part of the new voice of, of what we want in our future. Yeah, we had the... One of our events was last year, which was the Duchamp event. And I think it was the f one of the first times I'd um, spoken to the group. And I had been wanting to... Th think about how to connect with philanthropy and to connect with a vision for the group and feeling like, you know, the rise of the child and the voice of the child and the rights of the child around the world in a time of great precariousness and instability, um, but that those rising forces are clearly there and they excite me. So this notion of, you know, this the archetype or the symbol of um, you know a young girl in a world now where young women um, are kind of like the missing link, and you know whether it's climate change, um, top top six on drawdown is education of young women, especially in uh, in the global south, and. Uh, for us, you know, with the Greta effect as well and watching that play out and connecting to that inner child in myself and the girl who became a woman and suddenly life changed and there was a sense there was less freedom and when you're existing within, um, within frameworks, institutionalised spaces, we have to look at those stories, how to retell those stories or re-examine them and then also encourage a contemporary culture to form mm. as, a, as a foundation to that and that we take that seriously as well. And so there's big ambitious ideas around the change that you want to see in the world. Practically, because we're talking big ideas, practically how can art do that? What's the power of art to actually move, move and make change? Oh, look, I think... Um, I think it just it can happen at any moment in the day. I mean, the green of this room is making me feel <laughs> instantly <laughs> heart space, you know, like the green, the chakra and the heart space and nature. And when we think of our bodies and our, our bodies of water or our bodies of societies and culture um, and our own bodies and our own freedom, um, it's not something that we, it's not something that anyone has to give to us. But... Uh, Weirdly, we live in this society where um, the, the, the system is kind of lagging 
and the progress is there but the system is lagging and I think um, how, how we can use these platforms, uh, it could be anything. We've just sent out boxes to kids who don't have connector pens or paper even at home or they might be sharing a, a, a household computer or they might not even have any materials to be creative with. Um, one of our projects that we support with Atelier is um, our art to heart boxes that go out to kids. We're piloting that at the moment. There's instructions in there that um, guide the, the students through mindfulness exercises and um, learning about self-portraits and learning about observing your world. And there's all of these creative tools in there that we've chosen to, to give. Um, and that reciprocity, that feeling that comes back to us. And if that idea, that pilot can then become um, more expansive or maybe we can scale it and progress more people along the way by setting a precedent. So we do that with, um, with the way that we acquire art as well. So yeah. thinking about... Tell us the latest acquisition from the gallery. Uh, so Kent Monkman is, the, is one of the latest acquisitions. He's a Cree First Nations Canadian artist and he was commissioned to do the grand entrance court at the Met in New York, which I have not been there, but one day, um, which was a phenomenal uh, messaging, I guess, to have the uh, illustrious space and the beautiful space that, um, to be offered that mm. opportunity to tell a story as politically charged and um, epic sort of um, da Vinci kind of esque paintings that retell stories um, or tell stories that mm, have really. been manipulated and yeah. need to be amended and we just need to get on with those things and embrace them. I think cate ca categorising, compartmentalising, siloing, you know, that's feminist art, that's First Nations art, that's queer art. I'm just not interested. I feel there's way, I mean, it's the same with the subjectivity of how you experience your world, you know. I consider you an artist, I consider you an artist, I consider everyone in this room an artist. Um, I did a lot of tours at Uluru, facilitation of tours with a First Nations teacher and the amount of people that come through that space is phenomenal. So you'd, you'd start to see patterns of how people would respond to these workshops. Um, and these workshops were all about belonging. So learning the, the foundational <coughs> symbols of language, which are the U shape. So U is bird's eye view, looking down. When we sit, we leave a track, which is a U. Um, and that's how it became the generic symbol for, for human. Um, and then the tools that are beside you would um, denote uh, gender, but more than gender, responsibility to your community and your path towards education. So if you had women's tools, uh, that was indicative of your role in the community and your... Um, reaching of that point in your life, that milestone of having passed through initiation throughout your life to the point where you are now a woman, able and skilled to, um, to exist in that landscape independently, but also ingrained in that is your responsibility to the rest of your community sure. as well. Same and with it men. It makes me think about that, that U shape is a mark that people make on the land in the same way. I think that art is a mark that we're making as humans in a point in time and mm. I, I really appreciate as you're talking I'm thinking that art is the messy humanity of us it can't sort of be you know a system and kind of all empirical so that's the, the beauty of it that there's so much that we can do with art and expressing it I'm going to end with the same question to these guys for you what is the connection between art and the human heart Ah, oh, well, I guess your heart is like a thermometer in a way, um, or it, it's a gauge, it responds, it communicates. Am I correct that it communicates to the brain more than the brain communicates to it? And that it has, it's the first cell of the human 
body. So I think its significance is, um, is biological, sociological, spiritual, yeah. um, and, and it's embodied as well. And, you know, sorry to keep going back to the, the desert, but um, just that understanding of the body and the separation of the body that we have in our culture to the land, um, which is a huge generalisation when we look out and think, oh, that's land and this is me. Mm. Um, it's so hubris and uh, learning from them how healing um, works and how education works. It's so tactile. It's so relational. It's so embodied. Um, and everything carries that essence, everything, it just flows. So I think the relationship between art and, and the heart is just uh, one, two letters away from each other. It's true, yeah, so, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> thank that, you, Saha. That makes it sense. does it. Yeah. Does it. Thank you so much. Please thank Saha. In, I'm sorry, we've gone over as well, so in the interest of time, I won't take any questions, um, but you can grab a seat there. I just do um, want to thank our panel again so much for being here. I think the, the conversation is, is so interesting, particularly at this point in time when we're really grappling with what it means to be human and what is happening in our world. For next month, under the cloak of COVID, it's going to just be um, televised only because the three of my guests are all in Melbourne, so I'm not going to bring them up. <laughs> don't want to have any outbreaks. But um, it, the topic is igniting change, and it's incredibly exciting because we looked at purpose early in the year, and then we looked at productivity. So for me, it's where the two meet, and it's where the rubber hits the road. And whether it's social change, whether it is um, in business or kind of in the world that you want to see, it's all about how we get our momentum. So the full speaker lineup will be announced um, on Monday 3rd of August so you can have a look and subscribe on our um, on our website as well for that but again thank you everyone for being here and go safe go well thank you thank you guys I've got little gifts for you